Recall that electric current is the flow of electrons. The term phase when talking about electricity refers to electrical current. Recall that there are two types of current, AC and DC. DC circuits use a constant value of current, and AC circuits use waves of current. Phase comes from studying the sine wave. Current flows in a sine wave in an alternating current, AC, circuit. The sine wave phase is the distance between its actual starting point shown in blue and the ideal starting point shown in red in the image. Recall that motors are devices that turn electrical energy into mechanical energy. This means that they use electricity from your outlet and rotate their load. This load can be a wheel or a fan. A single phase motor uses a single current source. Single phase motors have very simple setups. These single phase motors are usually found in small home devices like fans, heaters, and refrigerators. One kind of single phase motor is a single phase induction motor. It has two parts, the stator, which does not move, and the rotor, which moves. The power goes into the stator, and the load is connected to the rotor. A load can be a wheel that the motor is turning. Now that we know what a single phase motor is, let's look at how to inspect it. The first step when testing a motor is to make sure the power supply is off. Next, we want to check for any obvious signs of damage on the outside. Look for any burnt, dented, or other damaged areas on the body, fan, and shaft. The following steps will test the electrical health of the motor. We are checking earth resistance, power supply, and motor capacitor. Let's check the earth resistance of the motor. Recall that resistance is a property of circuit components that resists the flow of current. The earth resistance is the natural resistance of the motor. We can measure this resistance using a multimeter. Make sure the multimeter dial is set to ohm or continuity settings. Connect the probes to the earth wire and motor frame. If the multimeter shows half an ohm or less, the motor is fine. Otherwise, the motor is faulty. Next is checking the power supply to the motor. The power supply is usually the outlet or battery pack that the motor is connected to. The last test is to check the capacitor. Recall that a capacitor is an electrical component that stores energy. It will help get the motor started. Set the multimeter dial to C setting. Connect the probes to the positive or negative sides of the capacitor. There will be a written number for the expected value of a capacitor with a tolerance. Capacitance is often written as a value positive or negative the tolerance on the body of the capacitor. If the multimeter reads outside the tolerance, then the capacitor is likely faulty. For example, if a capacitor were made as 100 microfarads positive or negative 10%, we would expect the actual tolerance to be between 90 to 110 microfarads. While single-phase motors are suitable for many small devices, commercial and industrial devices need much more power to run. A three-phase motor uses three current supplies. Instead of a single sine wave, we now have three sine waves, and all spread out to reach peak current at three times the single rate. Three-phase motors also have a stator and a rotor, just like single-phase. The stator does not move and accepts the electrical power. The rotor is attached to the rotating load. Three-phase motors offer a lot of advantages. They can run much larger loads for industrial uses. They do not require any motor starters, unlike single-phase. They operate at the peak current three times per cycle instead of one. There are some disadvantages, however. First, because the power supply is so large, there is a high cost of wire insulation. Recall that insulation is a method of protecting wires from unwanted electrical contact, such as a human touch or to another metal component. Three-phase motors cannot handle overload. As a result, when the motor is damaged, it is difficult and expensive to fix. This is because having three power sources makes taking the motor apart and identifying the faulty components difficult. 
Inspecting a three-phase motor starts the same way as a single-phase motor. Start by making sure the power supply is off. Next, we want to check for any obvious signs of damage on the outside. Look for any burnt, dented, or other damaged areas on the body, fan, and shaft. The next test is to check the earth resistance of the motor. Recall that the earth resistance is the natural resistance of the motor. Set the multimeter dial to ohm or continuity settings. Connect the probes to the earth wire and motor frame. If the multimeter shows half an ohm or less, the motor is fine. Otherwise, the motor is faulty. The last step is to check the motor's winding resistance. We will explain this process in the next topics. Motor windings are rings of conductive wire in the motor. They are usually wound around a metal object, or core. The wires are insulated from the outside and also insulated from each other. This forces the current to travel the intended path and not skip across wires. In the motors we have talked about, there is one winding for each stator and rotor. The stator windings accept the three-phase AC supply. The rotor winding accepts the direct current, DC, supply. Recall that DC is a constant value, not a wave. As with any component, motor windings can also fail. The coils of different phases, like in the three-phase motors, need to be separated from each other to avoid damage. When inspecting the motor windings, we are just checking the motor resistance. We will use a multimeter to do this. The multimeter needs to connect to the motor terminals, so we must remove the motor casing to find them. Set the multimeter dial to the highest ohm settings. Connect the multimeter probes to both ends of each winding. If the multimeter shows a value of resistance, the winding is working. If there is an OL, there is likely a break in the wire. OL stands for open loop. An open loop does not have continuity across the wire. If the wire is broken, the motor windings would need to be replaced. It is also possible for the windings to short circuit. A short circuit is when there is accidental contact in the circuit, which can cause the circuit to overheat and fail. If there is a short circuit in our motor, it would be because a winding is touching the conductive motor frame. To check, attach a multimeter probe to a winding and the other probe on the motor frame. If there is a resistance value, the winding has caused a short circuit. If it reads OL, then the current is staying in the wire. That means there is no short circuit. Motor starters are electrical devices that help a motor start and stop safely. It also protects the motor. The main functions of motor starters are To safely start a motor To safely stop a motor To change the direction of a motor, clockwise to counterclockwise To protect the motor from overload We can inspect the motor starter using a multimeter Set the multimeter dial to the continuity setting. Make sure the motor and starter are off. Calibrate the multimeter by touching the two wires together until it reads close to zero. Recall that motor starters may have multiple terminals. Two of them are coil terminals. And four to six terminals of these input-output terminals. First, we need to check the coil of the motor starter. Attach the probes to the coil terminals. The multimeter should read a resistance value. If the multimeter reads OL, well, the circuit is broken, and the motor starter is faulty. Next, we need to check the motor starter contacts. Attach the multimeter probes to the input, L1, and output, T1, terminals. It should read OL or 1. If it shows resistance, then the motor starter is faulty. It is faulty because the motor starter is closed in the on state, which is incorrect. Lastly, we need to repeat the previous steps after closing the starter contacts. This means that the motor starter would be activated and should form a complete circuit. If there is resistance, then the motor starter is working correctly. Otherwise, if it shows OL or 1, the starter is faulty. In HVAC systems, the control boards are installed with signal lights to indicate the service status.
Recall that control boards are the brains of an HVAC unit that receive inputs and give out signals to perform different activities. The signal lights display a failure code which helps the technician to identify the faults. Different colors of signal lights present in the furnace control board represent different functions. These signal lights are commonly red, green, and yellow. Recall that signal lights refer to specific problems in an HVAC unit. The function of signal lights can be summarized here. A slow flash on the red signal light indicates normal operation. A quick flash indicates normal operation and calls for heat. Two blinks indicate a flame switch failure. A three blink on the signal light indicates a pressure switch failure. The four blinks indicates a faulty temperature switch. The continuous blinks on a signal light indicates a failed controller. No signal light in the control board indicates no power to the furnace. Recall that a capacitor is a device that stores electrical energy. It stores energy in the form of an electric field that is created between two charged plates. Two conductive metal plates are physically separated either by air or an insulating material like paper or plastic. This allows for each plate to store electric charge. If the plates were touching, then the capacitor would be no different from a wire. Capacitance is related to the area and distance between the plates. Capacitance is directly related to plate area and inversely related to the separation distance. This means the bigger the plates are and the closer they are together, the higher the capacitance. There are three common types of capacitors. Single run capacitors have two terminals. Dual run capacitors have three terminals. Start capacitors have two terminals and are often used for the startup. Capacitors are designed for many different types of systems. Some systems, like strong motors, need much higher capacitance ratings than others, like small electronics. Capacitor ratings are usually printed on the body and are measured in farads, F. In a single phase motor, the capacitor's functions are, set the rotation direction, clockwise or counterclockwise, provide power needed to start the motor, and increase power while the motor is running. The capacitance is the most important quantity to check if a capacitor is working correctly. We will use a multimeter on the capacitance, C, setting to test it. First, we disconnect the capacitor from the circuit. We need to discharge the capacitor to get rid of any leftover charge inside. The safest way to discharge the capacitor is by connecting the terminals of the capacitor with the resistor. When the capacitor is disconnected and discharged, make sure there are no physical damages to the capacitor. Look for dents, dirt, burn marks, damaged terminals, or bulging. The design capacitor ratings, MFD, should be printed on the body. Make a note of the value and the tolerance. Recall that this capacitor is rated at 7.5 microfarads with a tolerance of 5%. We would expect the measured value to be between 7.1 to 7.9 microfarads. Dual run capacitors usually will only have one tolerance value. This tolerance applies to both ratings. Let's look at an example of this 45 fifths microfarads capacitor with 6% tolerance. This capacitor has a rating of 45 microfarads between the HERM and C terminals. 6% of 45 is 2.7. We should expect a reading between 42.3 and 47.7 microfarads between HERM and C. The capacitor also has a rating of 5 microfarads between the FAN and C terminals. 6% of 5 is 0.3. We should expect a reading between 4.7 and 5.3 microfarads between FAN and C. Place the black multimeter probe on the C terminal. Connect the red probe to one of the other terminals for a dual run capacitor. If we are reading values very far from the expected values, then the capacitor is faulty. Think of a basic light switch in your house. To get the lights to turn on, we have to manually flip the switch. Now, what if there was a way to have the lights turn on automatically when it gets dark out? For this, we could use an electrical relay. Relays are switches that are operated by electrical signals. There are tons of different relays for a variety of uses and sizes. Relays are normally used in control panels, manufacturing, and building automation to control power sources. 
Relays are used in high-powered loads instead of manual switches. Relays are also quicker to respond to. These loads include air conditioners, motors, street lights, and more. Switches are usually only used for low-power uses like house lights and fans. The DC signal is driven by high-voltage AC home appliances through microcontrollers. A microcontroller is a tiny computer chip that is programmable to help us control electrical systems. First, we need to power off the circuit and control power, then disconnect the relay. We should check for any obvious external damage. Look for dents or burn marks on the casing of the relay. Next, we'll use a multimeter to check the terminals of the relay. Set the multimeter to the OM or continuity setting. Use the highest setting if there are multiple. For most relays, there will be four terminals. Three will be oriented the same way, and the fourth will be perpendicular. The perpendicular terminal will be the outlet of the relay. The center of the remaining three will be the inlet. The other two are the control pins. Start by measuring the resistance across the two control terminals. There should be a resistance value. If the multimeter reads very high resistance or OL, the relay is faulty. This means there is a break in the coil that would prevent the relay from working. Now, test the inlet and outlet terminals. The multimeter now should read OL. This is because the switch should be open without any applied control voltage. If the multimeter shows resistance across the hot terminals, then the switch is stuck in the closed position. This means the relay is faulty, as the switch should be open with no applied control voltage. Now we will look at how to inspect a relay with control power applied. We need to test the relay when the switch is closed. Attach two wires to a low voltage power source, like a battery or a jumper box, as seen in the video. Attach the two wires to pins 85 and 86, the control coil terminals. When the wires are connected, and the power source is on, we should hear the relay click. The click is the switch changing to the closed state, allowing the current to pass through the circuit. Detach one of the power source wires. Now, set the multimeter to the continuity settings. Attach one multimeter probe to pin 30 and the other to pin 87. This will test continuity across the switch when it is closed. Now, attach the wire that completes the control side. The multimeter should beep to show continuity. If it does not beep, there is no continuity. This means that the switch does not change to the closed state. The relay is then faulty. In this module, we learned about electrical relays. Relays act as switches that activate electrical signals. We know how they work and how to use all terminals to set up a relay circuit properly. We also learned how to troubleshoot a relay. With no control power, the control side should show resistance, and the circuit side should show O. With control power, the circuit side should show continuity.